M-O. This is N5BB, November 5, Bravo, Bravo. So if you don't mind me asking, what's your name and where are you located? Uh, the name is Larry, uh, located in Plano. Uh, you're uh, pretty close to Frisco, actually, the northwest corner of it. Good, Larry, this is Bill. I'm in Irving kind of central Irving, so I am east of the south entrance to DFW Airport, close to Highway 183, so I'm kind of between DFW and Love Field, and uh, my office is in Plano, but on the other side of Plano from you, I'm on South Plano at uh, Bush Turnpike and Preston Road right north of that interchange, which is the very south edge of Plano, a couple of miles east of the Dallas North Tollway. That's where my office is. So I'm up that way pretty often. But I have very little reason to go up to your area. <clears throat> the industry I'm in, there's just no customers up that way. I'm calling on places like Lockheed Martin and L3 and Rockwell Collins. This is inside BB. first described uh, your your office, I thought maybe you were at the uh, uh, Baylor Hospital there, that's right at uh, Preston and uh, Toll Road. But, uh, yeah, we, well, I, unfortunately, we get down there a little too often, I'm afraid. Uh, my, some of my wife's uh, uh, doctors are down there, and the physical therapists, and of course the hospital, which we seem to uh, know pretty well. But, uh, yeah, well, you know, I'm uh, pleased that uh, you, you know Plano a bit and uh, regret that you have to drive so far. And it's, uh, I'm, I'm fairly certain that's not a real fun drive for you either way at any time of the day. Uh, that would be my suspicion anyway. K5 IMO, back to you, sir. Larry. Um, well, my office is... Uh, about one to two blocks from that <laughs> from that hospital. So if you go to the hospital and you go about one or two blocks north. Uh, it's a four-story building, um, and we're in some shared office spaces on the fourth floor of that building. So you wouldn't know we were in it by looking at the building. <laughs> Anyway, um, we're very good. Um, yeah, I'm in the electronic test equipment sales business. And it takes me all over the place. I travel quite a bit. In fact, tomorrow afternoon I have to go to Minneapolis. This is in 5BB. Well, we're, we're, by the way, there is a blizzard, so it's, <laughs> it's very snowy up there in 5BB. I certainly don't envy you. Uh, that's not one of my favorite places in the world, uh, even in the summer and the winter in particular. So yeah, it's uh, when this this winter's been pretty, and even spring's been uh, quite different. It's uh, I never know from day to day whether to run the air conditioner or the heater. Uh, it, you know, it's been pretty pretty strange over the whole country. I mean, Well, I uh, hope I know they've got. They'll have the roads cleared by the time you get up there. They do a good job of that, so that shouldn't be a problem. It's just dealing with cold and the snow banks and, and the dampers. Uh, yeah, hopefully, it's going to be a short trip for you. Sir Larry, it's only about uh, 24 hours, slightly over 24 hours, and I'm not actually driving. I'm not getting a rental car. I'm going to take a shuttle bus over to the hotel, which is right adjacent to the airport. And then one of our local guys there is going to come and pick me up on Monday morning and take me to or from the customer, which is very close to the airport also. So 
we're not going very far. And uh, by the way, you said you don't get on the radio too much. I think I've talked to you maybe in the distant past. Um, the uh, tonight is the night of nights of death on um, this repeater at 6.30 to about 7 is the DFW traffic net and all but one night of the month it always meets at 6.30 p.m. the early traffic net and then at 7 o'clock to roughly 8 o'clock it's the tech net that's T-E-C-H net these are all run by the Dallas, uh, well, that net's run by the Dallas Image Radio Club but anybody can participate I happen to be net control tonight. I was filling in for somebody else that was out of town. And on TechNet, we talk about anything technical, amateur radio related, and amateur radio news and science news and all that kind of stuff. So you can come and ask a question like, uh, why doesn't my coax cable work outside in the weather? Or how do I solder a connector? So, uh, or what kind of antenna should I build? or what are sunspots? All those kind of amateur radio related things. So that is that is on every Saturday night on this repeater between 7 and 8 o'clock, roughly. Then at 9 o'clock in this repeater, at five minutes from now, there's something called Skynet. And we talk about everything that's up in the air. Satellites, uh, Space stations, planets, space probes. W5FC. Astronomy in general, most of it's astronomy. Uh, some of it's amateur radio related, some of it's just plain old astronomy and science related. And that then starts at 9 and goes to about 10.30. And then at 10.30, there's another net called Afterglow, where we talk about usually science fiction movies. Occasionally other movies, but it's usually science fiction movies. So if you want something to listen to and participate in on Saturday night, tune in on this repeater. And with that, we've got four minutes until the net, so I'm going to say 73. Good talking to you, Larry. Come by and participate sometime. We'd like to have you at some of our nets. You do not need to be a member to participate. Uh, K5IMO, this is N5BB. Good evening. Good evening. Yes, indeed. Uh, I'm actually familiar with uh, with all those nets. Uh, uh, it's been a while since I've, uh, I've been on there. You know, for quite a while, I was a regular to both the uh, TechNet and the, uh, the SkyNet, and I was on TechNet a couple of weeks ago. And uh, unfortunately, that at the time of night is difficult for me to uh, to break away, but. Uh, yeah, I, uh, I fully hope to get re-engaged. I always did enjoy it. I hope to get re-engaged, and, and uh, yeah, I'll uh, I'll catch a little bit of, uh, of the net tonight. Uh, I'll be short time, but I will try to catch a little bit of it anyway. Thanks, uh, thanks for the information. Thanks for the uh, uh, the correction on uh, on the station call sign, and uh, well, we'll talk to you here in a bit. So. N5BB, K5IMO, I'll be clear. Very good, Larry. Yeah, you probably talked to me on TechNet. I looked at the log, and you're on my log, so I probably talked to you as that control at some point on that net before. And, um, oh, yeah, I've had the same thing happen to me. I've got the, the radio on, volume's kind of low, or it's noisy, and the noise in the background, and I hear something, and I think it's somebody you know, announcing himself, essentially calling CQ, but it's the repeater ID. I wish they would make it only be CW. I could still understand it just fine, but it wouldn't confuse people thinking there was a voice station. Anyway, good to talk to you, Larry. See you later. K5IMO is 5BB. Have a very good evening. Chairman, I need to make myself very clear. If we uplink now, Skynet will be in control of your military. But you'll be in control of Skynet, right? That is correct, sir. Skynet.
And does it mean one need to use the repeater before we begin tonight? Skynet. X-ray. My name is Tom. I'll be your net control for this session of the DARC Skynet. Skynet is a weekly net called every Saturday night at 9 p.m. concerning the subject of astronomy. Our pr purpose is to help amateurs become familiar with the nighttime and daytime sky, astronomy, and space in general. This net is open to all amateurs interested in this topic, and we encourage your participation, uh, comments, and suggestions for this net. with priority or emergency traffic may enter the net at any time by using the pro sign, break, break, and your call sign. Is there any emergency or priority traffic? Please come down. This is a direct net. Please do not transmit without direction from net control. That would be me this evening. And stations are reminded to ID at the end of their transmissions. This weekly net operates on this frequency, which is 146.880 MHz, with a PL tone of 110.9. Check ins via echo link are also possible using the W5FC-R station ID or echo link node 37247. Tonight's topics, astronomy charts, pictures, and live audio video links are available online. Just go to the club website, which is w5fc.org right now, for the complete list. And remember to tell others about this popular net. All amateur radio operators are welcome, and you need not be a member of any amateur radio club to participate. This net is approximately 90 minutes long and is structured in several parts. We have general announcements, Texas Astronomical Society of Dallas events, where and when you can look through a telescope, discussion topic of the evening, what you can see in the sky tonight, a future constellation object or topic, recent astronomical discoveries, space exploration and space history, visible satellite passages over the next couple of days, astronomical Q&A, and the 73 round. We don't know if we'll get to all of those topics this evening, but we will do the best we can. So we'll get it, go ahead and get started. I will take uh, round one check-ins. This, this would be low power and short time check-ins. Low power, short time only. Please come to your call sign, your name, your location. Let me know if you're either or both of those things, low power or short time. Please come now. India, Mike, Oscar, Larry, Plano, short time. Hotel to five, India, Zulu, Foxtrot, Dave, and Mesquite, short time. Golf, Uniform, Sierra, Gus, Far North, East Dallas, Low Power. Let me get those three check-ins. K5IMO, Larry and Plano, short time. KD5IZF, Dave, the mayor of Mesquite, uh, short time. W5QS, Gus, far northeast, Dallas, low power. Low power, short time. Uh, one more round. Please come now. None. I'll go ahead and ask, uh, does uh, any of the low power short time stations have anything they wish to bring to the net? Please do so. Please give your call sign now. Keep 
Let's go ahead and move on to general check-ins. If you'd like to join us this evening, please come with your call sign phonetically, your name, where you're transmitting from. That's your QTH. Please come now. This is November 5, Bravo, Bravo. Bill in Irving. November Tango 5, Tango Mike, Tony, mobile in Dallas. You will go 5, Papa, Mike, and Richard. Kilo 5, Kilo, Tango X ray, Kelly in Quinlan. Kilo Charlie 5, Oscar Dooley Tango, Carolyn in Louisville. Echo Bravo Bravo, David in Dallas. Echo Golf 5, Vector Julio Papa, Robert Richardson. Kilo 5, Alpha, November Papa, Alan in Dallas. There. Let me get my check-ins here. N5BB, uh, Mr. Bill over in Irving. NT5TM, Tony, Mobile in Dallas. KT5P, Mr. Mike Richardson. K5KTX, Miss Kelly in Quinlan. KC5OZT, Miss Carolyn in Louisville, my neighbor. W5EBB, David in Dallas. KG. D.J.P. Victor Juliet Papa Robert in Richardson K5A.N.P. Allen in Dallas. Thank you all. Additional check-ins, please come down. This is Twisty Marlowe Five Oscar Zulu Lima Brendan DeSoto. This is November Five Romeo Papa Zulu Mark in Arlington. Foxtrot 5, Zulu, Bravo, Lima, Bill, Farmer's Branch. Get those three. WB5OZL, Miss Brenda DeSoto, and Five R P Z Mark in Arlington. Welcome. K five Z B L. Mr. Bill, our president in Farmers Branch. Okay. Don't worry. I'll pull additional check-ins a little later over R F. I'll go ahead and take Echolink check-ins now. Echolink only. We'll give you extra time. Please come now uh, with your name. Your, uh, your call sign, your name, where you're transmitting from. I'll give you extra time. If you do not have a mic, that's okay. Just type in that you're there into the chat box. Please come now, Echo Link only. Only. KB9SGY, David and Chippewa Falls, Wisconsin. KB9 SGY. Kilo Golf 5, Bravo Zulu Whiskey, J near Weatherford. Ron in Fairview. November. Yankee Echo Oscar. Stephen in San Antonio.
This is Kilo Bravo 5, Romeo Hotel Echo. Brian in Fort Worth, Kilo Bravo 5, Romeo Hotel Echo. All right, trying to do the paperwork here, so there's a little bit of a delay. Let me get everybody checked in whom I saw. I've got Kilo Bravo Niner, Sierra Golf Yankee, David in Chippewater, Wisconsin. I hope I got that one right. Welcome, David, KG5BZWJ near Weatherford. I think he gave me a new place, too. I'm not quite sure, but I know he has been near Weatherford, N5YEO, Stephen in San Antonio, KB5RHE, Brian over in Fort Worth, uh, John, I think I caught you over on the uh, chat box, K5JDW, John over in his, his second home, the summer home in Norman, Oklahoma. Um, additional check-ins, I'll take any mode. If you'd like to join us this evening, let me know now. Please come out. Hearing none, that's okay. There will be other opportunities to check in. So uh, let me go ahead and ask if there are any announcements or bulletins. Please come out. November Tango 5, Tango Mike. NT5 PM, Tony, you're the guy. Go ahead. Um, uh, I know you're going to do a better job with one of these than I am, but I would like to mention that we do have a net following this net, the Afterglow movie discussion. Tonight's movie is the 1983 Matthew Broderick classic, War Games. Sometimes the only winning move is not to play. We're going to be talking about that right here on this repeater at 10.30 tonight. Me and the club president, we have posted some interesting announcements up at W5FC.org. Uh, he's got a message up there about our next club radio play day in the park. And I've got some details about the next lecture in lab, which is going to be pretty exciting. I'm really looking forward to it. We're going to be uh, buying and learning to operate a little software-defined receiver that works with pretty much any computer. So it's going to be very cool. And there's more details on all these things at W5FC.org. I hope you'll have a look. This is NT5TM. Thank you, Tony. Does anyone need any fills or have any questions? All right, very good. I'm going to go ahead and ask at this point, um, N5BB, Bill, do you have anything for the National Space Society you'd like to bring to the net this evening? Oh, maybe. This is in 5BB. I warn you, my computer had a blue screen of death twice yesterday and once or twice earlier today. So if it crashes here, 
uh, in the middle of me talking about things, I may lose all my information. Um, I need to buy a new PC. Uh, this is inside BB. Um, the, the National Space Society um, is a nationwide organization all about space. And the local chapter for North Texas meets in Irving at the Spring Creek Barbecue on Highway 183 at Beltline uh, across the street from Irving Mall. The meeting time is the second Sunday of every month, and the meeting itself usually starts around 3.30 p.m., where we have a, uh, a speaker normally for about an hour, and then after that, there is the business meeting of the club. So that's the National Space Society. The next meeting, oh, the previous meeting was this last Sunday, and the next meeting will be on Sunday, May the 13th, Mother's Day, actually, at 3.30 p.m. National Space Society meeting last Sunday, the main uh, discussion, the presentation, was about Bigelow Aerospace. Bigelow is um, developing big modules. They look like kind of rectangular balloons. They're, they're, they fold up, and then when they uh, put, you know, air in them, they they expand like kind of like a balloon, but they're kind of rigid on the outside. And they're designing these to be folded up because uh, something like a, a space station is mostly empty space. And so if they can fold them up, they can transport it much easier. And building them is easy. They just pressurize it and boop, it pops up into shape, more or less. They don't have to put a bunch of sections together. So currently, one of these uh, sections, one of these test modules, is attached to the International Space Station. It was taken up one to two years ago. I forget exactly when. I want to say it was late 2016, but I could be wrong. The, um, the Diglo has a lot of new plans for sending up more of these and actually building little small space stations, independent from the ISS. And so they're working with different companies that are looking at having crew vehicles to take people up there. And they're thinking about a space hotel. Now, there's other competing companies thinking about the same thing. But Bigelow is quite a ways along with actually having structures they've been testing in space. And so they would have a space hotel, and you could go up there for several days and then come back. So we had a talk about uh, that by one of the National Space Society local members, and it was very entertaining. As far as uh, future activities, and then I'll shut up. <laughs> uh, the National Space Society has an activity a week from the day, Saturday, April the 21st, at uh, the Wilson Elementary School in Capel. Uh, it's a STEAM event, Science, Technology, Engineering, Arts, and Math. So it's like STEAM with Arts, and it's going to be at the school in Capel a week from a day. If anybody's interested in that event, they can talk to me. Um, then there's another event um, uh, scheduled for the uh, Girl Scout STEM Academy which is opening up near, um, it's near the Boy Scout uh, site at Wisdom, uh, uh, Wisdom Hill, Wisdom, Camp Wisdom. It's near the Camp Wisdom, but it comes, you're coming in from a different direction to that same hill. And that's going to be on May the 5th, Saturday. And then uh, the National Space Society will be participating at uh, the Frontiers of Flight Museum for uh, the Moon Day event. This is N5BB. Thank you.
good, Bill. Thank you. And does anyone need any fills? Please come down. ICX, I'm net control for tonight. Skynet! Let's see. Um, next thing up, uh, tonight's After Glow movie. Everyone's ready. Write this down. There will be a test. David Lightman was a bright student. He knew just about everything about computers. He knew how to hack into the local school system and change his girlfriend's grade from a D to an A+. She was impressed. You could find every dial-up line in the Pentagon, White House, even Atari. But his biggest and most frustrating moment was before him. The computer stared back blankly, flashing an ominous message. Cannot find Windows 31.dll. The update hadn't taken, and all his work was tracked in the 386 computer. He called Microsoft, but the line was busy. He didn't dare show his girlfriend his predicament. Join us for the next After Glow Moody War Movie. It could be Moody. The After Glow Movie War Games from 1983. I guess we're doing a lot of 1980s films. Tonight at 10.30 p.m. Does anyone need any films? is golden, or your computer is locked up. Either way, I'll go ahead and ask uh, those the Texas Astronomical Society events, meaning, is there anyone out there who would like to discuss that? Please come out. K5, KPS. KTX, Miss Kelly, go ahead. Thank you, Tom. This is K5KTX, and I guess I will start with the monthly meetings for the Texas Astronomical Society of Dallas. Uh, they are held on the fourth Friday of every month, except for November, when they are on the third Friday due to Thanksgiving, and we usually don't have a meeting in the month of December. The meetings are held at the University of Texas at Dallas campus in Richardson. The meeting begins at 7.30 p.m. in the Science Learning Center building, which is SLC, or Sierra Lima Charlie, on the campus map. The best place to park is going to be in Lot H, where we have uh, now been given permission to park in orange, gold, or green spaces after 5 o'clock p.m. on Friday. You can park anywhere else as long as you choose a green space, but Lot H is, I uh, believe, the closest to the building. Um, so uh, just try not to get a ticket. The meeting includes programs presented by members or guest speakers and a slideshow of the current constellation of the month. because um, at 7 o'clock they will have alternating months where they will do a beginning astronomy class. And this month, for the month of April, I believe that the topic is going to be apps related to astronomy. So some, um, some cool tools uh, that you can use for astronomy. And that will be at 7 o'clock p.m. Um, on the fourth Friday of April. Um, and then the other month they will do a uh, new members orientation. And even if you're not a member, um, it's pretty neat information. You can see where our dark sky site is up in Oklahoma and um, lots of other information. I do not have speaker information for the April meeting at this point, but uh, we are having a meeting. They are free and open to the public. You do not have to be a member to come to the meeting. Texas Astronomical Society also hosts observing parties every Saturday night beginning at sunset. Each week is at a different location for observing, so make sure you get complete details for the Saturday night you wish to attend. You can go to texasastro.org and click on the calendar link up at the top, and you can get all of the details for, um, for each event that we have. Tonight, we have
had two events going on. One, the Frisco Star Party, and I forgot to look and see if that was going on. As far as I know, it is a, it was a go for tonight, and that is at Frisco Commons Park. It's a very nice location. The park uh, people turn off the lights for us for that event, and it's uh, usually the event where we have probably pretty much the largest attendance. Um, and then also tonight was the uh, Palo Pinto Mountain State Park Star Party, and it was a go as well. And uh, I know there's uh, several people checked in, so you might not be at that, but we will have another one coming up in October. We do two of these a year. This is a state park that has not opened yet. They're still trying to get funding um, to get it developed out, but we do work with the Fort Worth Astronomical Society and have star parties there twice a year. And uh, very dark skies, just a short distance uh, to the west um, near Strawn, Texas. And um, it's going to be a fantastic astronomy facility once uh, the park actually officially opens. And if it was a little bit too cold for you to get out tonight, then you can try again next week. The third Saturday is at J.W. Williams Park in Cedar Hill. Or the fourth Saturday is at Lakeshore Park in Rockwall. And then we'll come back around to the first Friday, uh, uh, first Saturday of the month, which will be in Spring Park in Garland. Again, the same as our meetings, they are free and open to the public. And if you are wanting to learn something about telescopes, let's say if you're thinking about buying a telescope, this is a great place to talk to people and to learn about the different types of telescopes and what their advantages and disadvantages are. And they love to talk about their telescopes. And uh, it's a great place to look through them before you place down an investment and, and buy one for yourself. And again, if you'll go to texasastro.org and pull on the calendar link, um, or just explore our website, we have lots of great information there, um, then um, you can get all the information about all of our events. And I guess that's all I've got. This is K5KTX. Ms. Kelly, and this is KE5ICX Net Control for tonight's Skynet. Does anyone need any fills? Please come now. Go ahead and take additional check ins. If you'd like to join us this evening, please come now with your call sign phonetically, your name, and where you're transmitting from. Oops. Yeah. Kilo Golf 5, Tango, November Foxtrot. Foxtrot, India, Dallas, Ted, Low Power. November 5, Whiskey Oscar India, William and Allen. All right, let's see here. I have WB4, MFI, Ted in Dallas. Recognize Will Power, N5WOI, William and Allen. Welcome back. And the often neglected and forgotten KE5JIT, Randy in Louisville on Echo Link. Anyone else that wishes to join us, please come now. Kilo Golf 5, Tango, November Foxtrot, Johnny in Garland. Very good. 
good. I got KG5 TNF, Johnny, over in Garland. Thanks for joining us. I got you checked in over on Echo Light. Okay, well, I, there's always the dubious or the honor of being able to do, as net control, the topic of the evening. Now, sometimes that can be a great thing, and you've got something to uh, brimming that you would like to bring to the net, something that somebody has never talked about or otherwise, and you are an expert at it. Other times, it's, oh my, I've got something I have to do this evening, and I better come up with something fast because it's this evening. Well, mine is a little bit of both, or the uh, latter than the former. So here's what I have for this evening. Uh, tonight's topic is tracking Apollo 8 by telescope. As anyone who knows me for more than a millisecond, I am a big fan of the Apollo uh, program to get to the moon. And I do uh, my uh, Dawson thing. Uh, I volunteer over at the Frontiers of Flight Museum. And I spend a lot of time hanging around the Apollo 7 command module. That's the reason why I spend my time volunteering at the museum, is because of the spacecraft in close proximity and uh, my opportunity to tell people about stuff that I know about it and even more things I don't know about it. But I thought, well, here's something that is kind of interesting, and this has to do with uh, spacecraft uh, going between Earth and the moon and the fact that from Earth, by telescope, you could actually see these things. Yeah, you could. There's a fellow, his name is Bill Keel. He wrote an article about a million years ago on the interwebs, and he talked about the fact that you could see, by telescope, a spacecraft going to the moon. A very tiny spacecraft in the uh, main scope of things, <laughs> yeah, scope, telescope of things, and uh, he wrote an article probably about 15 years ago. It is still on the internet. I give you the URL, but it is so complicated and difficult to read. I won't, but I'll leave it up on the w5fc.org website if you'd like. I'll also put some pictures up there directly from his posting from those many years ago, and you can follow along, or you can go to w5fc.org and you'll find those links there or the pictures uh, or the equivalency in some way, shape, or form. So go ahead and read this article um, and explain what Bill, Bill had to say and what was seen back in 1968 when Apollo 8 went to the moon in December. So he says, watching satellites in Earth orbit has proven to be a popular and easy pastime. It may not be appreciated these days, but that it was possible to observe the Apollo spacecraft during transits between the Earth and the Moon. Many of these reports exist only in printed form from the time before most electronic indexing had reached. This page begins to document telescopic observations of the Apollo lunar mission. It remains a work in progress, and I welcome further contributions and references. And he says, uh, uh, the first sightings of each mission were, of course, the launches, watched by hundreds of thousands of people lining the Florida beaches. He says, I uh, start the fun with these, uh, well, he says two images that he did uh, as uh, uh, he was 13 before and during the Apollo 15 launches. I, I don't have those pictures here, but you can imagine. Now I share his enthusiasm because I did see the Skylab 1 launch, the last uh, Saturn V launch back in 1973. So, I get it. This is what he says. Uh, the Apollo 8, this is tracking Apollo 8, which is the first uh, Command Service Module Apollo spacecraft to go to the moon. It spent 10 laps around the moon in 1968 during December of that year and then returned to Earth. Uh, essentially, we won the uh, race to the moon with Apollo 8 because the 
Soviets didn't have any way of actually getting there and coming back. The N-1 rocket sailed uh, back uh, in 1968-69 time frame uh, twice, and as such, uh, we won uh, going to the moon, which was one of our missions, uh, thanks to uh, John F. Kennedy. And as such, uh, this mission probably was even more important than Apollo 11. I know people feel otherwise, but I don't. Apollo 8 got us to the moon. So here we go. This is what he says. Apollo 8 was extensively tracked owing to the great interest in the mission and the novelty of the lunar trajectory as well as somewhat better illumination than other, uh, some later missions. Many reports were collected in an article in the March 1969 issue of Sky and Telescope, uh, which was Optical Observations of Apollo 8, and it was written by Harold B. Lehman. Uh, who is with Boeing Scientific Research Laboratories, and he does a citation as to where. The technical rationale for these observations as a more or less coordinated program was to explore the power of optical tracking for refining spacecraft orbits. In comparison with the usual Doppler range and rate data, optical observations trade uh, poorly determined uh, range and line of sight of velocity for excellent angular location and transverse motion. Uh-oh, this guy's getting very technical. Some of the following pictures, and I have them linked, uh, are from Sky Publishing Corporation Reproduced. Various professional observatories were notified in advance with phone updates as needed, landline of course, of the coordinates of Apollo 8 at observable times as it neared the moon and later returned. The spacecraft appeared against the star, stars of the constellations Aquarius and Pisces. Objects followed an Apollo in its path to the moon. For much of the way until the major course correction, the four spacecraft lunar module adapter, or SLA panels, which uh, formerly uh, protected the lunar module, and for Apollo 8, a dummy mass uh, taking the place of the lunar module, would still be tumbling in the same telescopic field of view. For early missions, the Saturn V third stage itself, the S4B, would remain close to the spacecraft as well. One of these, likely from the Apollo 12 mission, was temporarily recaptured in a large orbit around Earth after 30 years in solar orbit between 2002 and 2003. That's true. Most of the later S-4Bs were deliberately crashed on the moon, generating seismic signals of known strength and location to be picked up by the Apollo surface instrument packages. The brightest reflection to be seen from the Apollo stack would have been the flat mylar-coated shades of the command module's windows. Um, it says Lehman uh, calculated the expected magnitude of a, spec of, uh, a specular reflection from these shades would be as bright as a tenth magnitude in lunar orbit. In practice, most sightings in deep space were of the steadier diffuse reflection from the entire spacecraft enlivened by the tumbling of the adapter panels. I have a picture of that. It's not very exciting, but I do have a picture of the S4B fuel dump. If you want to take a look at that, you can. The first post-launch sightings involved either in the translunar injection or TLI burn of the S4B engine, or the dump of excess fuel from the stage shortly afterward. The usual daylight launches and short time spent in the parking orbit, which was lower than would be used for almost anything else to gain the little precious payload mass, meant that the visible sightings opportunities did not exist from the continental U.S. until the lunar missions left Earth orbit. Parking orbits ranged from 165 to 190 kilometers uh, in mean altitude in 
inclinations of 32 to 33 degrees. The first post-launch sightings were represented by a spectacular series of pre-dawn photographs shown from the Smithsonian Astronomical Observatory uh, station at Maui. spacecraft passed Hawaii, the changing perspective put the camera view looking up at a sunlit exhaust cube. For various missions, TLI took place between 2 hours and 50 minutes to 3 hours and 12 minutes after launch. Let's see, John uh, Stonesifer, NASA recovery team leader, deployed to the South Pacific aboard the USS Yorktown, both for the planned recovery and in case of early mission aboard. Uh, that's what he said. He reports the crew had an excellent view of the TLI from the carrier deck and that a similar sight was visible from the Hornet for Apollo 11. He notes somewhat ruefully that, quote, my biggest disappointment was that with all of NASA's photographers aboard as part of our team, we did not get any photographs of the sightings. spacecraft began its climb outward from Earth, several amateur astronomers in the UK photographed a fuel dump from the expended S-4B stage shortly after 1800 UT on December 21, 1968. This event was seen without prior notification by uh, two astronomers, uh, Kent Allen Heath and M.J. Oates, whose reports catching the clouds visibly while getting off a bus uh, photograph above, oh, <laughs> forgive me, this is kind of written crudely, it says, is by um, M.J. Hendry, and took a three-minute exposure beginning at 1816 Universal Time on December 21st, showing the blowout of excessive fuel from the third stage. View is five and a half degrees wide. Uh, let's see here, oh, my goodness. And it says there were a series of 14 pictures taken, some of them from for, uh, San Fernando, Spain. So the spacecraft was displaced against the background of stars by a parallax at the range of about 50,000 kilometers. And I do have a picture of this, and it's quite spectacular. Or you can go to w5fc.org and you can click on the link of the S4B uh, engine uh, fuel uh, expel expulsion. You know, I'll just do an aside on this. Uh, the S-4B stage, which is the third stage of the Saturn V, uh, had a lot of fuel on board. Its purpose is, was to force the um, uh, command service module and lunar modules into a uh, lunar injection uh, towards the moon. The fact that the spacecraft or the third stage would follow closely behind the uh, command module, and the fact that on a regular mission, the spacecraft may have to turn around and have to get very close to the S-4B, it was extremely important that that fuel would be expelled before all of these uh, procedures were done. And to make sure, because really it's kind of like a bomb sitting out there. So they would expel all of the fuel once the spacecraft was safely on its way to the moon. So getting rid of all that extra fuel was very, very important. Why the extra fuel? You may need it in order to fix the orbit in such a way or to make the translunar injection successful. So you had extra fuel on board. Continuing on from the Spanish Naval Observatory in Cadiz, uh, Oscar, Oscar Rodriguez has found the following image of the S-4B fuel dump. That's what I'm showing you now. It's filed as Apollo 8, although the dates scrolled on the back is more ambiguous at this point. The Apollo 8 dump was well seen from Spain. In May of 1969, article of Sky and Telescope notes the S-4B vented fuel liquid hydrogen and oxidizer uh, separately in perpendicular directions, which appear in two distinct clouds, as you can see in the photograph. Reports of Apollo 8 sightings came from the Pictou Midi Observatory, 
Um, let's see, that's in French uh, Pyrenees. The Catalina Station of Lunar and Planetary uh, Laboratory in University of Arizona, Carritos Observatory in New Mexico, and then operated in Northwestern uh, University, McDonald Observatory of the University of Texas, the Lick Observatory, University of California, U.S. Naval Observatory, Station of Flagstaff, Arizona, and JPL Table Mountain Observatory in California. By the way, all of which we've discussed in length on this net over the years. with my microphone, my pronunciation is perfect until um, so it's not. But thanks, I, I appreciate it. Let's see here. The first opportunity, I'm going to continue because there's going to be some other words that I'm going to have problems with with lots of vowels. Here we go. The first opportunity for large telescopes to view Apollo 8 en route to the moon fell to the peak D Midi, Dr. Michael Matsua reported an initial sighting through a finder of a 1.1 meter reflector as an object magnitude near 10 through clouds moving eastward near the predicted location of Apollo 8. He says it moved uh, to the 60 centimeter refractor. He moved to the 60 centimeter refractor because the drive problem in the reflector, observing a cluster of objects. These were obscured by the appearance of a nebulous cloud at the time which ma matches the firing of the service module's engine to assure adequate separation from the S-4B. This event can be traced with the Apollo 8 flight journal, which is online, by the way, noting that the launch was at 7.51 Eastern Standard Time on December 21st. Thus, the peak to meet observations started at Mission Elapsed 419. The separation burn of the service propulsion system, or SPS engine, was performed at 445. But do you care? No, I know you don't. I do mention that, um, let's see, the French sites, uh, let's see, Lunar and Planetary Laboratory, the LPO, pictures from the 1.54 meter telescope of eight hours after launch, uh, after, later, showed the spacecraft in the S-4B stage and some panel reflections. And they say, quote, in the Lunar and Planetary Laboratory photograph, Apollo 8 is in the center trail. Fainter booster parts are to the left and right in exposure with a 61-inch reflector uh, at uh, 20054UT in the 22nd. I don't think I've got that picture with me. No, I don't. But um, if I remember the viewing, you could see four distinct dots representing the, uh, the four-pedaled uh, lunar module adapter, followed by the, um, the um, um, expulsion from the S-4B. I know this is getting super geeky. I'm going to go ahead and skip through this a little bit, only because uh, I don't have the pictures up like I thought I would. Uh, oh, I do have, um, if you look at the Apollo 8 uh, Coralitos Observatory, uh, you will see the pictures of all of the elements uh, inside of it. Uh, the uh, upper left, you'll see, I think it is the command Wait a minute, let's see here. Uh, no, it's in the middle of the picture. You will see the uh, pedals from the command service module and the S-4B separating and then uh, going off in their various directions. 
I think the most interesting thing about all this, and I'm doing it in extraordinarily agonizing detail, is the fact you can see this stuff from Earth, from modest telescopes when there's uh, an emission of some sort that you can see, such as the uh, booster uh, firing, toward, to uh, anything that can reflect in space, everything from the small windows on the command module, which are exceedingly small. They're only about 12, 13 inches wide, uh, and they're triangular in shape, uh, to the entire spacecraft, which is in a silver reflective material to um, go ahead and deflect the sun's rays. Uh, these things can be seen from Earth, even at distances of uh, 100,000 to 200,000 miles away. skip down here. It says that it lit observations during the ret oh, uh, this is after they were returning to Earth, uh, produced live TV pictures broadcast to the West Coast to KQED. They're still around in San Francisco. During the evening of the 26th and 27th, spacecraft starts varying between magnitudes 14 and 17, brightening noticeably as the night proceeded and the spacecraft approached Earth. This variation was probably due to the rotation of the spacecraft, which spent most of its coast period in a slow roll, sometimes known as barbecue roll. You know this from Apollo 13, the movie. Uh, for uh, temperature control, TV screen pictures from the Elite Observatory on December 27th uh, shows the spacecraft some 10 seconds of arc at a 12-magnitude star. got to put the picture up earlier. At any rate, James Young from Table Mountain notes that they tracked all the Apollo lunar missions except 17. Final sightings, both delivered and accidental of each mission would come in during re-entry over the Pacific. NASA added camera pods to the uh, Apollo range uh, instrumentation aircraft uh, or area platforms generating pictures such as uh, as 29 here's a picture uh, at least on the uh, uh, stream of the aircraft uh, KC 135 with a, a big nose in the front and carrying tons of antennas making this agonizingly difficult, but at any rate, let me continue. As reported in National Geographic in May of 1969, the Apollo 8's re-entry was seen by a paid plane load of passengers thanks to Captain James Holloway flying a Pan Am Flight 812, a Boeing 707, en route from Fiji to Honolulu on December 27th. On spotting the re-entering spacecraft uh, to port, he announced its location to the passengers. He noted, quote, we watched as the color of the capsule brightened pinkish red, and we noticed a tail similar to that of a comet directly behind. The tail was as short at first, a dull orange streak. As Apollo 8 gradually came closer to the star-filled black sky, its glow changed from a soft orange to yellow and finally an incandescent white. The orange-red glow tail grew longer and more vivid. It did not flare. It was perfectly straight and of constant thickness, like the flash between, made between an artist and a, on a piece of black velvet. Estimated the length of the tail at 125 miles. We watched the spacecraft for three minutes. By that time, I had turned the plane around a full 180 degrees to follow it. Another Pan Am flight from Honolulu to Sydney had a ringside view described in an article uh, from the Sydney Sunday Telegraph for Sunday, December 29th. Additional sightings and pictures by airline passengers have been reported for at least, at least for Apollo 11 and 13. Tonight's Skynet. Okay, that was somewhat awkward, I agree, but I think that the message comes through clear, and that is, is that 
There are opportunities, and we talk about them with transits, with satellites and the space station and all of that. Smaller objects can be seen and are seen from space and uh, in space from Earth, and that's really important. There was a mention in the article about the S-4B, or the third stage, of a spacecraft, the Apollo 12 spacecraft, which does occasionally come back and revisit us. Unlike the other missions where the S-4B, or third stage, either crashed on the moon in order to take seismic measurements from the stuff left behind by previous astronauts, or were in Earth orbit and then uh, ended up returning to Earth, such as Apollo 7 and Apollo 10. Uh, those, I'm sorry, Apollo 7 and Apollo 9. I'll get them right. Apollo 9. Uh, the um, uh, only one S-4B remains undestroyed and still trackable, and that is the S-4B from Apollo 12. So, has it been seen recently? Yeah, 2004 it was seen, and returned into an Earth uh, moon um, gravitational influence and was actually tracked. At one point, it wasn't known to be from Apollo 12, and people looked at it and went, hmm, what is that? It had perfect uh, uh, visuals as far as the light coming from it, very, uh, very even, which means that it had to be extraterrestrial? No, terrestrial. now. Uh, this might be a good time to go ahead and take additional check-ins at this point. I'll go ahead and take additional check-ins as we take a break before we go to earthsky.org. Anyone who would like to join us, please come now with your call sign name, where you're transmitting from. I will do the same for Echolink afterwards. So over here, please come now. trying to break. I cannot uh, hear you. Uh, maybe I'm getting that locally. I don't know. Uh, another state, uh, anyone who would like to check in over air, please come in. Yeah, 5TX in the mobile. There's a blast from the past, AF5TX, BJ, he's mobile. Yeah, I know that voice. Uh, welcome, welcome, BJ. And let's see, any for an echo link, I'll take your check-ins now. Uh, either chat or over air. Please come in. They're being awful quiet over there, although there is some chat going on. I just can't read it because they have, I don't have my glasses on. But uh, 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 I see all over there. Some of you have not checked in. It's okay. Let's go ahead and continue. This is KE5 ICF, so net control for tonight's Skynet. And I do have my segment, which comes right after my segment. But that's okay because my segment is next. What we have is from firstsky.org, the forward slash tonight. You can go to this net uh, website anytime and see what's going on for this week and for tonight, of course. So they say for tonight, April 14th, throughout April and May, let the sparkling blue white star spike uh, help you find the famous Omega Centauri Globular Cluster, star cluster. That's because when Spica climbs highest up for the night, so does Omega Centauri. So you're asking, how can I find Spike Cluster, you ask? 
You can use the Big Dipper to find Spica. Just follow the arc and the Big Dipper's handle to the bright orange star Arcturus, and then drive a spike. Keep extending that arc to Spica. So you just keep going, man. The transits climbs to its highest point in the sky in the middle of the night at 1 a.m. daylight savings time in mid-April for all locations around the globe. With each passing week, Spica will transit half an hour earlier. By mid-May, Spica will be transiting, appearing highest in the sky at about 10 p.m. Uh, or 11 p.m. daylight savings time. Uh, you can find Spica's transit time for your sky at the U.S. Naval Observatory. When Spica is highest in the south, for the northern hemisphere viewers, Omega Centauri is too. When Spica is highest, look for Omega Centauri about 35 degrees directly below it. A fist at an arm's length is approximately 10 degrees. You can see Omega Centauri with an unaided eye if your sky is dark enough and if you're far enough south in on the Earth. People living south of 35 degrees north latitude have a realistic chance of spotting the cluster over the southern horizon. Though we've seen at least one report of Omega Centauri seen as far north as uh, Point Pele National Park in Canada at 40 degrees north latitude, Omega Centauri looks like a fairly faint and possibly fuzzy star. And of course, it's awesome from the southern hemisphere. But what if I'm in the southern hemisphere, you ask? I can see you all asking that question. As seen from the southern hemisphere, Spica and Omega Centauri pass more nearly overhead. They will transit at approximately the same time, midnight and mid-April at 10 p.m. in mid-May. They're still located about 35 degrees apart. From the southern hemisphere, you've got a beautiful way to find this cluster, and indeed your view of the cluster will be better than ours in the north because Omega Centauri will be higher in your sky. Uh, let's see here. To get in the general vicinity of the, on the sky's dome, look for the famous Southern Cross, which is, is officially is the constellation Crux. Along the eastern edge of Crux is the dark uh, Colsac Nebula near the Colsac, visible with binoculars, and the Jewel Box as an open star cluster with about 100 members whose stars are colored red. So you're asking, what is Omega Centauri? It is the largest and finest globular star cluster visible to the ILO. Globular clusters are large, symmetrically shaped groupings of stars, fairly evenly distributed around the core of our Milky Way galaxy. Many northern stargazers have this particular cluster on their bucket list. Seeing Omega Centauri is very special in part because you can see it with your eye alone, assuming you have a dark enough sky. Very few in the Milky Way galaxy's 250 or so globular clusters are readily seen without optics. Like all globular clusters, Omega Centauri is best seen through a telescope. Then you see it as a globe-shaped stellar city teeming with the estimated 10 million stars. So, the bottom line is, from the northern hemisphere, you can use the star Spica and the constellation Virgo to locate Omega Centauri on springtime nights from the southern hemisphere start hop from the southern cross to the dark uh, coal sack nebula to the jewel box start to Omega Centauri. All right, I'm uh, losing my voice. I need a rest. Uh, the U.S. Naval Observatory has a wonderful site that allows you to go ahead and uh, view what you can see in the sky this week. Uh, just Type in U.S. Naval Observatory Sky This Week as separate words, six words, and you'll be able to find all of this. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, go to Miss Carolyn, KC5OZT from KE5ICX. You have a constellation for us this evening. Please go ahead.
say thank you, Tom, and uh, tonight we're going to look at another Leo, all right, uh, but we're going to look at Leo Minor, the little line. It's a small, faint constellation, only one star brighter than fourth magnitude, and it was created by Hevelius. In 1687, he created it from 18 stars between Leo and Ursa Major. Leo Minor is the 64th constellation in size, and it's being relatively new. It has no myths associated with it, but he wanted to fill in between Ursa Major and uh, Leo. Brightest star, uh, known by the star name of uh, Praesepia, I guess. <laughs> it's a uh, magnitude 3.83. Uh, he thought it would get an alpha designation, but the astronomer that, that decided to letter all stars brighter than 4.5 magnitude omitted this designation from his catalog, so it didn't get alpha. And the second brightest star is Beta, uh, and it's the only star in the constellation that has a Greek letter name. It's a binary with class G and F, and the brighter star is magnitude 4.4, and the companion is magnitude 6.12. And then we have an interesting, uh, it's an orange dwarf star. It goes by the name HD878, no, 8, let me start over, 8, Seven, eight, eight, three. Try to say that. <laughs> but it's an orange class K dwarf at a magnitude 7.5. And a planet was discovered orbiting this star in 2009. And this exoplanet is a long period. It takes seven and a half years to complete an orbit around this star. <laughs> And moving on to the deep sky objects, we have an interesting one, it has an interesting name called Hanny's Vorwerp. It's an unidentified astronomical object, but it was discovered by a Dutch school teacher, Hanny Van Arkel. She was taking place, part in the Galaxy Zoo project as an amateur. And, uh, Object's name means Hanny's object in Dutch. And it's located near the spiral galaxy IC 2497. It just appears as a bright blob, but it is believed to be the size of the Milky Way and has a large central hole. And um, both the object and the galaxy are about 650 million light years away, and uh, it's thought to be the, the the outflow of gas from the galaxy core, and that gas interacting in a region of the object is creating, creating new stars, because uh, the youngest stars are only several million years old, and a theory suggests that uh, this is composed of remnants of a small galaxy, revealing the impact of radiation from a quasar event, maybe uh, some hundred thousand light years ago. I think the quasar event is it stimulated the bright emission and a theory explaining the absence of a light source is because the object and galaxy are 
so far apart, between 45,000 and 70,000 light years, the warp vorwarp <laughs> is showing a ghost image of the illumination of the quasar, or simply a light echo of events that occurred uh, before those currently seen in the galaxy. And a more recent theory suggests it comes from a supermassive black hole at the center of the galaxy and uh, interacting with the gas. So an amateur can discover some pretty interesting objects, uh, like Annie did. <laughs> Our number two object is NGC 3432, sometimes known as the Knitting Needle Galaxy. It's three degrees southeast of the star 38, Leonis Minoris, and it appears almost edge on at a magnitude 11.6, but it can be observed in amateur telescopes. I don't have a picture, but we have an, another barge spiral uh, that is also almost dead gone, NGC 3003, magnitude 12.3. And then number three, we have NGC 3344. Now this one is a spiral seen face on, about magnitude 10.5. And then there are two other objects uh, within reach of amateur scopes. Uh, these are all NGC numbers. Uh, 3486, that's a nice spiral galaxy. Magnitude 11, seen by some. 2859 is uh, what's called a lenticular galaxy at magnitude 11.8. It has a prominent bar and a bright central region, but the outer disk appears as a detached ring. And then the final object is a barred spiral galaxy, magnitude 11.7, it's uh, 3504. And it is a starburst galaxy with a lot of star formation and worth watching because Two supernovas have been observed in recent years, in 1998 and again in 2004. So the little line may be uh, uh, small, smaller than it's uh, than Leo, but it ha definitely has some interesting and odd and worthwhile objects to observe. So uh, take a tour through it and. Uh, Enjoy that, uh, K-5-O-Z-T. Thank you, Ms. Carolyn. I'll go ahead and take additional check-ins. Anybody who would like to join us or have any questions, please come down. Let's go ahead and go to Ms. Brenda, WB5OZL. What have you for us this evening? Uh, good evening, Tal and Lynette. This is WB5OZL. And uh, we're running kind of uh, short tonight on time. So I'm going to just read half of each of these articles. This article is entitled, Outback Radio Telescope Listens In on Interstellar Visitor. The, uh, the t a telescope in outback Western Australia has been listened to, used to listen to a mysterious cigar-shaped object that entered our solar system late last year. The unusual object, known as Oumuamua, <clears throat> came from another solar system, prompting speculation it could be an alien spacecraft. So astronomers went back through observations from the Murchison <clears throat> Wide Field Array. to check 
checks for radio transmissions coming from the object between the frequencies of 72 and 102 megahertz, similar to the frequency range in which FM radio is broadcast. What they did not find, uh, while they did not find any signs of intelligent life, the research helped expand the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, SETI, from distant stars to objects closer to home. When Oumuamua was first discovered, astronomers thought it was a comet or an asteroid from within the solar system. But after studying its orbit and discovering its long cylindrical shape, they realized it was neither and had come from interstellar space. Telescopes around the world train their gaze on the mysterious visitor in an effort to learn as much as possible before it headed back out of the solar system, becoming too faint to observe in detail. On Curtin, distinguished professor Stephen Tenge from the Curtin University node of the International Center for Radio Astronomy Research said the NWA team did not initially set out to find Oumuamua. We didn't set out to observe this object with the NWA, but because we can see such a large fraction of the sky at once, when something like this happens, we're able to go back to the data and analyze it after the fact. If advanced civilizations do exist somewhere in our galaxy, we can speculate that they might develop the capability to launch spacecraft over interstellar distances, and that these spacecraft may use radio waves to communicate. While the possibility of this is extremely low, possibly even zero, it's not just as important that we avoid complacency and observe and examine observations and evidence without bias. The MWA is located in Western Australia's remote Murchison region, one of the most radio quiet areas of the planet, and far from human activity and radio interference caused by technology. It's made up of thousands of antennas and t attached to hundreds of tiles that dot the ancient landscape, relentlessly observing the heavens day after day, night after night. So the research team was able to look back through all the MWA's observations from November, December, and early January, when it was, when Oumuamua was between 95 and 590 million kilometers from Earth. We found nothing, but as the first object of its class to be discovered, Oumuamua has given us an interesting opportunity to expand the search for extraterrestrial intelligence from traditional target, targets such as stars and galaxies to objects that are most much closer to Earth. All right, the other article is entitled Tiny Distortions in Universe's Oldest Light Reveals Strands in Cosmic Web. Scientists have decoded faint distortions in the patterns of the universe's earliest light to map huge two black structures invisible to our eyes, known as filaments that serve as superhighways for delivering matter to dense hubs such as galaxy clusters. The international science team, which included researchers from the Department of Energy's Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory and UC Berkeley, analyzed data from past sky surveys using sophisticated image recognition technology to home in on the gravity-based effects that identify the shapes of these filaments. They also use models and theories about the filaments to help guide and interpret their analysis. Published April 9th in the journal Nature Astronomy, the detailed exploration of filaments will help researchers to better understand the formation and evolution of the cosmic web, the large-scale structure of matter in the universe, including the mysterious unseen stuff known as dark matter that makes up about 85% of the total mass of the universe. Dark matter con constitutes the filaments, the which researchers learned typically stretch across hundreds of millions of light years and the so-called halos that host clusters of galaxies are fed by the universal network of filaments. More studies of these filaments can provide new insights about dark energy, another mystery of the universe that drives its accelerating expansion. Filament properties can also put gravity theories to the test, including Einstein's theory of general rel relativity, 
and lend important clues to help solve an apparent mismatch in the amount of visible matter predicted to exist in the universe, the missing baryon problem. Usually researchers don't study these elements directly. They look at galaxies and observations, said Shirley Ho, a senior scientist at Berkeley Lab, Cooper Siegel, associate professor of physics at Carnegie Mellon University, who led the study. We use the same methods to find the filaments that Yahoo and Google use for image recognition, like recognition, like recognizing the names of street signs or finding cats in photographs. The study used data from the Baryon Oscillation Spectroscopic Survey, or BOSS, and an Earth-based sky survey that captured light from about 1.5 million galaxies to study the universe's expansion and the pattern distribution of matter in the universe set in motion by the propagation of sound waves or baryonic acoustic oscillations rippling in the universe, in the early universe. It's a very long article. I don't have time to get too much more. I think I need to go ahead and turn it back to the net. This is, these are both from sciencedaily.com. This is WB5OZL. All right, very good. Thank you. Um, let's go ahead and go to uh, space exploration in space history. Ms. Kelly, K5 KTX, what have you this evening? Thank you, Tom. This is K5 KTX. And there's been a lot of attention lately on some of uh, NASA missions, such as an upcoming InSight mission that launches in about 21 days or so, and the test mission uh, uh, launch that's coming up. And uh, so I wanted to talk about a mission that not too many people may have heard about, but it's the um, historic Parker Solar Probe mission, which will revolutionize our understanding of the sun, where changing conditions can propagate out into the solar system, affecting Earth and other worlds. Parker Solar Probe will travel through the sun's atmosphere, closer to the surface than any spacecraft before it, facing brutal heat and radiation conditions, and ultimately providing humanity with the closest ever observations of a star. In order to unlock the mysteries of the sun's atmosphere, Parker Solar Probe will use Venus's gravity during seven flybys over nearly seven years to gradually bring its orbit closer to the sun. The spacecraft will fly through the sun's atmosphere as close as 3.8 million miles to our star's surface, well within the orbit of Mercury and more than seven times closer than any spacecraft has come before. Flying into the outermost part of the sun's atmosphere, known as the corona, for the first time, Parker Solar Probe will employ a combination of in-situ measurements and imaging to revolutionize our understanding of the corona and expand our knowledge of the origin and evolution of the solar wind. It will also make critical contributions to our ability to forecast changes in Earth's space environment that affects life and technology on Earth. The spacecraft will perform its scientific investigations in a hazardous region of intense heat and solar radiation. The spacecraft will fly close enough to the sun to watch the solar wind speed up from subsonic to supersonic, and it will fly through the birthplace of the highest energy solar particles. To perform these unprecedented investigations, the spacecraft and instruments will be protected from the sun's heat by a four and a half inch thick carbon composite shield which will need to withstand temperatures outside the space that reach nearly 2,500 degrees Fahrenheit. The primary science goals for the mission are to trace how energy and heat move through the solar corona and to explore what accelerates the solar wind as well as solar energetic particles Scientists have sought these answers for more than 60 years, but the investigation requires sending a probe right through the 2,500 degree Fahrenheit heat of the corona. Today, this is finally possible with cutting-edge thermal engineering advances that can protect the mission on its dangerous journey. The Parker Solar Probe will carry four instrument suites designed to study magnetic fields, plasma and energetic particles, and image the solar wind. The Parker, uh, oh, here are some mission quick facts to know. At closest approach, the spacecraft will hurtle around the sun at approximately 430,000 miles per hour. That's fast enough to get from Philadelphia to Washington, D.C. in one second. 
a close approach to the sun, the front of the Parker Solar Probe solar shield faces temperatures approaching 2,500 degrees. The spacecraft's payload will be near room temperature. On the three, the final three orbits, the spacecraft flies to within 3.8 million miles of the sun's surface. The mission is named for University of Chicago Professor Emeritus Eugene N. Parker, whose profound insights into solar physics and processes have guided the discipline. It is the first NASA mission named for a living individual. In the mid-1950s, a young Eugene Parker proposed a number of concepts about how stars, including our sun, give off energy. He called this cascade of energy the solar wind, and he described an entire complex system of plasmas, magnetic fields, and energetic particles that make up this phenomenon. Professor Parker also theorized an explanation for the superheated solar corona, which is, counterintuitively, hotter than the surface of the sun itself. Nano flares, which in, ab in enough abundance could cause this heating. More than a half of a century later, the Parker Solar Probe mission will finally be able to find proof for Parker's groundbreaking theories and ideas, which have informed scientists about solar physics and magnetic fields around stellar bodies. Much of his pioneering work, which has been proven by subsequent spacecraft, to find a great deal of what we know about how the Sun-Earth system interacts. The um, spacecraft has arrived in Florida to begin final preparations for its launch to the Sun, scheduled for July 31st. It will be launched from uh, Launch Complex 37 at Kennedy Space Center. The two-hour launch window opens at approximately 4 a.m. Eastern Time on July 31st, and it's repeated each day through August the 19th. And then, very quickly, in space history this week, April the 9th, back in 1959, the first seven astronauts were announced to the public. Astronauts Shepard, Grissom, Cooper, Shaw, Slayton, Glenn, and Carpenter became known as the Mercury 7 or Original 7. These brave men became the face of the space program and remain an inspiration to many. On April the 11th, 1970, Apollo 13 Commander Jim Lovell, Command Module Pilot Jack Swigert, and Lunar Module Pilot Fred Hayes launched to the moon on NASA's third planned lunar landing mission, and I'm sure most of you have seen the movie Apollo 13, so you know what happens next. Also on April the 11th, back in 1986, the family, the famous. Halley's Comet, which only makes an appearance once every 75 years, was last seen from Earth, which means I guess I won't ever get to see it, because I didn't see it in 1986. Seeing Halley's Comet is a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity, twice if you're lucky. The first observations of the comet date back more than 2,200 years. However, it took until 1705 for English astronomer Sir Edmund Halley to suggest that we might be seeing the same comet over and over. He noticed the similarities in orbits between the comets observed in 1531, 1607, in 1682 and correctly predicted that it was, in fact, one comet that would return in 1758. Unfortunately, Halley died before he could see his prediction come true, but when it did, astronomers named the comet in his honor. And, of course, April the 12th is a um, big day in uh, space history, the first being in 1961, Yuri Gagarin became the first human in space. The launch of the Soviet Union's Vostok 1 happened at the Bakunar Cosmodrome in Kazakhstan. Uh, Gagarin's 108-minute flight took him around the Earth once at a speed of 17,800 miles per hour. For landing, Gagarin did not stay in the Vostok capsule. Instead, he ejected from the spacecraft and landed by parachute. This is because the Soviets had not yet developed a braking system for landing on the ground. The Soviet Union kept this secret for many years because international standards for flight records require the pilot to take off and land in their vehicle. As it turns out, nobody quibbled about this detail. And April the 12th, 1981, the first space shuttle orbiter of Columbia on mission STS-1 was the first orbital space flight of NASA's space shuttle program. It returned on April the 14th, 54 and a half hours later, having orbited the Earth 37 times. Columbia carried a crew of two, Mission Commander John Young and Pilot Robert Crippen. 
It was the first American manned space flight since the Apollo Soyuz test project in 1975. SGS-1 was the only maiden test flight of a new U.S. spacecraft to carry a crew, though it was preceded by atmospheric testing of the orbiter and ground testing of the space shuttle system. The launch occurred on the 20th anniversary of the first ever human space flight. This was a coincidence rather than a celebration of the anniversary. A technical problem had prevented SGS-1 from launching two days earlier as was planned. And with that, I will turn it back over to the net. This is K5 KTX. Right, thank you, Ms. Kelly. You, you, you did an admirable job. Thank you so much. This is KE5 ICX on Net Control for tonight's Skynet. Uh, we're closing it out. If you would like to join us and be a part of tonight's net and the count, please come now with your call sign, your name, where you're transmitting from. Please come now. Hello, Foxtrot 5, Tango, Sierra Kilo, Pearl, and Dallas. KF5TSK Burl in Dallas. I know what you're waiting for. The next net. This is KE5ICX. Tonight we had 27 hams participating on the air. Thanks to all of you who checked in this evening. We hope you'll join us here next week and every Saturday night at 9 p.m. to discuss astronomy, space, and space exploration on this net. The sky is never the limit. We are always looking for net control stations for this and all the other DARC nets. If you'd like to join us or you'd like to try your hand at this, please contact any of the net controls by sending an email to, write this down, nets at w5fc.org. You can follow topics and discussions about this net, astronomy in general, on Facebook and on Twitter as well as our audio video feeds, video archives and other useful internet resources by going to the club website, which is w5fc.org at the conclusion of this net. Until next Saturday night, this is Kilo Echo 5, India Charlie X-Ray Tom, and I'll be closing the net at uh, 22.32 local time and returning the repeater to normal use. 7-3, everybody, and enjoy the evening discovering the universe. And don't forget, we have the Afterglow movie coming up here in just a few minutes, about five minutes. So if everybody would like to take a break for about five minutes, if you'd like to come back and check in, do so then. Tonight's movie is War Games. This is KE5 ICX. I'm clear for now.
Zen 5 HYP. Gary and Tom, we're starting in 30 seconds. Be ready. KE5 ICF. All right, everybody get back to your seat. This is KE5ICX. Yeah, I pulled duty this evening, but if you want to be net control, you can at any time. We'll go ahead and get started. Uh, tonight's movie is War Games. I'll go ahead and give a uh, little bit of a, a uh, preamble on this thing, and then I'll tell you the rules of the road. Here we go. War Games is 1983 American Cold War science fiction film directed by Lawrence Lasker. I don't know who he is. Walter F. Parks. Don't know who he is. Directed by John Badham. Don't know him either. The film stars Matthew Broderick. Yeah, I got him. Dabney Coleman. Yeah. John Woods. Eh. Ellie Sheedy. Yeah. Uh, the film follows David Lightman, played by Broderick, a young hacker who unwittingly accesses Whopper. That's the War Operation Planned Response Computer, a United States military supercomputer originally programmed to predict possible outcomes of nuclear war. Lightman gets Whopper to run a nuclear war simulation, believing it to be a computer game. The computer now tied into the nuclear weapons control system and unable to tell the difference between simulation and reality attempts to start World War I, I, I. It was a box office success, uh, costing about $12 million and grossing $79 million after five months in the United States and Canada. The film was nominated for three Academy Awards. Uh, let's see. <laughs> A sequel, War Games The Dead Code, was released direct to DVD in 2008. Who knew? All right, I'm just, just going to read the first paragraph on the wiki about the plot. During a surprise drill of a nuclear attack, Many United States Air Force strategic, strategic missile wing controllers prove unwilling to turn the key required to launch a missile strike. Such refusals convince John McKittrick and other system engineers that NORAD, uh, 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 at NORAD, that missile launch control centers must be automated without human intervention. Uh, control is given to the NORAD con uh, supercomputer, Whopper, the War Operations Plan Response Program to continuously run war simulations and learn over time. Of course, things get out of control when a teenager goes ahead and messes this all up. He's from Sunnyvale, California, and he's looking for a computer game co company only to connect to the supercomputer. Hijinx begins. And this is KE5ICX Alpine Net Control for tonight's After Globe. All right, this is how we play this game. We're going to go ahead and ask for check ins. I'm, let's see, I think the last time I'll, uh, let's see here, I'm not seeing the usual suspects. I'm going to go up with RF first. RF first. Uh, last time I did Echolink, so I'm going to do RF first and ask uh, for your call sign, your name, where you're transmitting from. Let me know if you 
1983 movie, War Games, that does not knock you out of the discussion. If you didn't, that's okay. If you did, or if you didn't and you do not wish, wish to participate, that's okay too. Too many. All right. Just let me know your name, your, uh, your call sign, your name, where you're transmitting from. Let me know if you saw the movie. Please start now. This is pretty healthy. Let me go ahead and get the check-ins now. N5HYP. What the heck, Tom? Yes, he saw the movie. WB5OZL. Miss Brenda in DeSoto. Yeah, she saw the movie. KF5TSK. Burl. Yeah, he's in Dallas. Yeah, he saw the movie. N5OF. Clay. New call sign in Mesquite. Yes, you saw the movie. KC5OZT. Miss Carolyn in Louisville, my neighbor. Look, I'm waving at you. Yes, she saw the movie. NT5TM. Tony and Aaron. Yes, they saw the movie. W5EBB. David in Dallas. You saw the movie. Additional check-ins. Please come now. Don't be shy. That's okay. I'm going to Echolink now. If you're on Echolink and you would like to join us this evening, please come now. I'll go ahead and put you on the list. Tonight's movie is War Games 1983. If you saw the movie, good. If you didn't, that's okay. We'll forgive you. Echolink only. Please come now. This is Kilo Golf 5, Bravo Zoo Whiskey, and I am pretty sure I've seen the movie, but I did not see it recently. I have KG5BZWJ over in Weatherford. I've got you checked in. And you did see the movie. I acknowledge that. Okay, this is KE5ICX. I'm net control for tonight's Skynet. Skynet. Wait, no, not Skynet. The Africa Movie Net. That's me. Okay. Um, Tom, N5HYP and everybody else listening, think about... In, uh, about the plot for this film. 
and any additional impressions you had on the film, that would probably be good, too. And 5 hyp Tom and Company, what did you think about the movie? Um, what did it mean? Go ahead. This is KE5ICX. This is N5HYP, yes. Um, well, we all saw the movie. Well, uh, Holly and I saw it back in 83 when it first came out. And, of course, it showed up on HBO a lot during the during the 80s. Saw it multiple times then. Hadn't seen it for a long while till, till the other night. Um, Anna's comment was really great. She said, boy, this is the most... Um, uh, entertaining movie that we've watched in this series for a long time. Uh, she'd never seen it before. She really liked it. The plot is uh, pretty fun. I mean, it's 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 a it's an interesting little ride. Um, one of the IMDb notes, uh, trivia notes, has to do with the fact that Ronald Reagan saw the movie, and that got him thinking about it. Was there a possibility for you know a cyber attack on? on our um, armed forces and missile missile defense system, and he was ultimately, you know, he brought the idea up to the Joint Chiefs, and the Joint Chiefs said they didn't know about it, but they talked to a NSA consultant, and yeah, he said, yeah, it's very plausible. And as we've seen today, it's still very plausible. Um, the plot was the plot was good. I mean, again, like a movie, there's just lots of leaps of faith you have to do. But um, you know, the, the story was cool and um, back then, and it still was a lot of fun now. So back to that. This is N5 HYP. Yes, thank you, Tom, and. Uh... I agree with a lot of that. We are talking about War Games from 1983. Keep that in mind. WB5OZL, Miss Brenda, in DeSoto, you saw the movie. What did you think about the plot? What did you think about the movie overall? Go ahead. This is WB5OZL. Well, I enjoyed it. Back then and now, uh, honestly, I didn't remember much of it from back when, but... Um, you know, a lot of plot holes, a lot of silliness, but it's so entertaining. It's just lots of fun, and um, and so we like that. Uh, I loved all the ancient technology, the computers and everything. Just, you know, really a walk back down memory lane. Um, lots of good actors, lots of, you know, the... The action goes on in a pretty good clip, so it was extremely watchful in my opinion. And um, love the music. There's um, a lot about this movie that's just really pretty good. I'm surprised it's held up after all these years, but it, it really has, except of course for the ancient technology. But that's just kind of a um, kind of the cherry on the Sunday to me. Okay, back to net. W B five O Z L. Thank you. Moving on, KFI PSK Pro. What you think of the movie? About the plot, you know. Go ahead. That's KFI PSK. Well, first thing I would say is it's you know this is a refreshing movie. No one died. No one got injured. We didn't have many animals. Um, I mean, it was just it was fun all the way around. You know, there was plenty of action. Never a dull moment. Um, you know, a few things seem to be out of place, but, um, you know, it, it's nice to see uh, a movie with uh, good resolution and the music was good. I mean, it's just totally enjoyable all the way around. Can't find PSK back to net. Thank you, Burl. I agree with that. N50F, Clay or Mesquite, you saw the movie. What do you think? What are your initial comments? Because we'll be asking for more. 
Oh, uh, yeah, Tom. Uh, one of the things that struck me about the movie is um, a little bit of a, a, a plot of just uh, how uh, he did something that was seemingly so innocent and how that just sort of snowballed into something really, really heavy and uh, just a sort of a, a side thing, how that can happen a lot of times. You start out small thinking nothing's going to be a big deal. It ends up into being an extremely big deal. And uh, another thing that I've sort of noticed here recently in seeing the movie is just finally going back and seeing uh, what I thought at the time was such a fancy computer and now I look back on it and he was using a floppy drive and all that thing, you know, and, and you don't see floppy drives anymore. And so it's just uh, cool to go back and see the change in technology. All right, this is Clay in 5OS, back over to the net. Thank you, Clay. Good point. KC5OZT. Miss Carolyn, your comments about the movie Plot and otherwise, go ahead. I enjoyed the movie, and uh, and plot-wise, it's got a lot of uh, elements, you know, the tension of the possible war, the military uh, men, uh, and the teenagers, you know, the uh, their point of view of everything, and, and even the... Uh, Poor scientist uh, on the island, you know. That sort of brings a touching touch to it. If, and it's a nice mixture of it, and it, it all comes together, you know. Kate's 5 oz Very good. Thank you, Miss Carolyn. And next, NT5TM, Tony. What did you think of the movie? I liked it when I was younger, and Aaron and I both still like it now. Uh, you purely in terms of plot, it is pretty Hollywood. Uh, we do have a substitute courtroom drama at the end. Instead of being in a courtroom, we get to be in the uh, big the boardroom with the big board. Uh, gentlemen, no fighting in here. This is the war room. Outline is, uh, you know, kind of Hollywood. Uh, it's really great that no one gets hurt. It's certainly much more entertaining in that respect than the day after. Uh, professionally, uh, trying to teach a computer futility is a pretty neat irony in the plot because, of course, you can't really teach a computer futility. Uh, they tend to do things over and over and over again and uh, overheat, but that's another story. There are even more dramatic moments of sparks and things shooting, so uh, so perhaps he did overheat for a minute. So, but the plot was not as original and fantastic as it could be, but it was entertaining and it served as a good vehicle for some interesting characters and acting, and and a kind of original story because uh, so often plots about nuclear war were either uh, heroic and redemptive, all redemptive, all a red dawn or they were disastrous all of the day after, or they were procedural, like Strategic Air Command. They showed us the heroism of the people doing these things that brought about the end of the world, even though the end of the world, if it actually happened, was pretty awful. So they did have an original way of avoiding the end of the world, which was nice.
contributed something to the culture. You know, it's a strange game. Uh, only winning move is not to play was, uh, you know, in movie terms, an original solution to the problem of nuclear war and the bomb and what do we do about the bomb. So uh, the plot was entertaining, very Hollywood-esque, but it did serve NT5 TM. This is KE5ICF Snap Control for tonight. After Goal Movie, I had to think about what it was. Thank you, Tony. Very good comments. W5 EBB, David in Dallas, you saw the movie many times. What are your impressions? What are your thoughts? Go ahead. Well, as others have said, it's uh, it, it's a uh, it's a more uplifting sort of movie with a with a resolution that. Uh, you know, has has a message, and you know it's just good Hollywood action. So you know it, it kind of conveys that you know, hey, we're on the right track, and and you know the the, the human aspect of things will 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 uh, will fix things even if computers go awry. But that said, it's it's the plot's a little bit far fetched. I mean, how could one person hack into you know an organization that is founded on protecting users' data. How could that happen? I mean, that's just unrealistic. And sarcasm is just one of my many talents. W5EBB. Thank you, David. Yes, I, I was listening and I, oh, I know where that's going. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Great comments. Uh, let's see. KT5BZWJ near Weatherford, maybe a new location. Uh, what did you think of the movie, Jay? And welcome back. We haven't seen you in a couple of weeks. Go ahead. This is KT5BZW. Um, and, and like I said, I did, I'm pretty sure I did see the movie, but I haven't seen it um, recently. Um, wish I, I wish I had so I could kind of get back into the, 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 the fun we have here, but I, I really, it's been so long that I, I'm just uh, enjoying the comments and, um, uh, I'll probably be going to bed soon, but, uh, I'll still be listening. So, uh, this is a KG, KG, Kills All Five Bravo Zulu Whiskey, uh, back in that. Thanks for checking in. I'm going to put you on the back burner there, but if you've got any comments, just go ahead and put a break in and say that you got something there. And there will be an open comments round. Uh, anybody can say anything, so be ready. Or you can go to bed, or you can stay up, or you can watch Battlestar Galactica, which is on right now on BTV. 21.2, in case you're wondering, Battlestar Galactica or Battlestar Galactica, BSG. All right, so I got some comments here, and the good news is when your net control or whatever you call this is that you can write down and list everybody's comments, and you can get really good at it. You don't even have to see the movie, and you can take and play different comments off of each other. But I'm not going to do that because I did see the movie Thursday night, Last night I watched Lost in Space. I won't talk about that, the new uh, Netflix show. Maybe that will come up in another conversation later. But here's the thing. It's been a number of years since I've seen this movie. I saw it in 1981. I think I had it on CED disc many years ago. That's since disappeared. But the movie is deceptive in the way it starts out. It looks like uh, The Last Starfighter. It looks like a lot of films uh, with kids uh, at that time with technology and gosh, those goofy kids, what are they going to do next? You reset. So you got to ask yourself, um, 
you know, where is this thing going to go? Uh, we've got the uh, video uh, arcade and all of that. We've got the uh, funky electronic music going on. You're going, doo -doo 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 -doo. where is this going to go? We've seen this before. And where it goes is in a completely different direction than everyone thinks. Some of the stuff that goes on in this thing uh, actually happened. Uh, Kevin Mendick, uh, who is a fellow now who is a, a, um, a, a, a security consultant, uh, uh, was a fellow who actually went in and, and did this sort of thing, got in um, to um, computer systems and that. One of the most innocuous things that you see and it still exists today, and that is, is that the, a person will uh, be able to, um, you know, figure out passwords and get into the mainframe or get into a system by opening a drawer and finding a, um, a password. You don't think that doesn't exist today? It does. I can guarantee you I can walk into an office anywhere and find a password and get into a system. that make me a genius? Absolutely not. I can open a drawer and find that information. What you have to do is have subterfuge to make it happen. And Kevin Mendick was one of those guys, which I think the Matthew Broderick character, uh, in this case uh, David Leitman, was based after, was Mendick, and being able to do that. And I think that's very interesting. What is the probability of that happening? I know it was sarcastically brought up by David, but it's true. He's right. It's true. Can that happen again? Yes. It happens every day. And that's the thing I think that's really important about this film from 1983, when everybody had, like, uh, uh, you know, uh, dial-up lines uh, with command line getting into systems. Uh, that was going on back then, and it's definitely going on today. at that point, there's a lot, I think, to say about this movie. I just find it fascinating, and I was very uh, satisfied with the result in the film. But I've got more to say about that from a technical aspect. I'm going to go to the... I'll, I'll go ahead and ask if there's additional check-ins. Uh, I will say that uh, Clay has checked out. He says, I'm done for the evening. He's tired. But I'll take additional check-ins. If you'd like to join us this evening... Our movie this evening is War Games from 1983. We're talking about the film. If you would like to check in, I will ask you about the film, too. Even if, if you've not seen it, just let me know you're out there, and I'll put you on the list. Additional check-ins, please come down. Them off. Let's go to the top of the list. N5, HYP, Tom. Now it's time to talk about, I guess, characterization or anything you'd like to add to the film. What did you think about the characters? Were they realistic or not or uh, otherwise uh, acting in an illogical or logical way? N5, HYP from KE5 ICX. Five ICX and the net. This is N five HYP. Um, you know, I always liked Matthew Broderick. I mean, uh, you know, um, he uh, is a, is a pretty good actor. Although he, he does a good job of playing the kind of sort of slightly sarcastic, slightly uh, um, you know. Uh, uh, trying to come up with the right word. Mischievous. That was the word I was looking at. Mischievous kind of guy. Of course, Ferris Bueller's Day Off. There we go. That's what he was. Mischievous guy. Ali Sheedy, of course, she plays kind of the, um, you know, a stereotypical, flirty, um, giggly, a little bit, um, uh, um, you know, a, a teenage type girl character that you would expect for this type of uh, scenario. You know, there were a lot of other interesting actors in there, and the, 
characters, you know, it's kind of stereotypical, the, the, the Texas uh, general with the salty uh, language, um, the uh, Daphne Colvin character uh, who was kind of the uh, um, genius, who, the guy who knew the technology but really didn't. Um, the, uh, the two, um, uh, the two computer geeks at the computer company, especially the one guy who kind of was trying to channel, um, 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 a Jerry Lewis, I think. <laughs> I was trying to figure, I was always trying to figure that one out. Um, but, uh, yeah, it was, it was, again, stereotypical but fun characters. This is N5HYP. Thank you, Tom. I, I felt the same way, but I'll, I'll save my comments on the Jerry Lewis part. Uh, WB50ZL, Miss Brenda, your comments on characterization, or anything for that matter. This is WB50ZL. Uh, it was stereotypical, but that's okay. You know, we had our geeky guy, of course, it's a guy because, you know, girls don't do computers, especially not in the 80s. And um, and his cute but kind of ditzy girlfriend, and then you got the scientist type and the military type. These places, thing is just full of types. Um, but that's okay. It works. Um, and um, this is, you know, I'm pretty sure I took my kids to see this in '83. They would have been two and five, and I'm pretty sure they enjoyed it. So. Um, it's something that could be appreciated by anybody on any level. It's pretty clean and um, uh, and not really hard to understand. But if you're so geek, you would look at all that equipment and you would know a whole lot more about it than I do. Um, yeah, Matthew Broderick can do no wrong. He is just adorable. And I've seen him in so many movies and he's just always wonderful and just a fantastic actor. And uh, they were all, they, they really assembled a pretty good cast there, I'll have to say. Um, okay, I'll turn it back to wb 5 zero. Right, you think that uh, Matthew Broderick is adorable. He's old now, but that's okay. Moving on. KFITSK, Burl, what do you think of the characterizations? Realistic or not? You're on. I thought the characters were really very realistic that uh, um, <clears throat> you know, it, it, everything fit together. You know, there would probably be a few things that, you know, was left out, but you know, uh, uh, Less than two hours, you know, you'd like to see a movie like that, but, uh, so you don't get bored or, uh, you know, want to leave, leave, lose track of it. So, you know, all, all together the characters really fit in very well, and, uh, you know, I thought the military people, you know, really fit the part. Can't find PSK back to net. Very good, uh, Burl. Got you down and uh, interesting. I would mostly agree with that. I had other comments. Uh, KC five OZT, Miss Carolyn, you have comments. Uh, Clay, you checked out, but if you want to check in, just do break, break. I got something to say, Carolyn. KC five OZT, go ahead. I thought there was a nice mixture of characters. Uh, the beginning, you know, and what just maybe the pressures that went on in the silos, you know, uh, and then uh, and then to the main part of the movie, military section especially. Uh, you had some uh, 
serious people, uh, like the scientists, and the, uh, we had some that were almost, I won't say exactly comedic, like the, I guess he was a general or something, but, uh, and then of course you have the teenagers, and, uh, uh, which, uh, I never got into uh, computer hacking, but he seemed very smart, you know, uh, for his age. Uh, but I guess that was normal back then. Like I said, I never got into hacking. So. But uh, it was a nice mix of characters, as well as uh, some very interesting ones. Kate Spavo said, T. Thank you, Ms. Carolyn. Uh, NT5TM, Tony and Aaron, I know you're listening. Uh, your comments on characterizations. Go ahead. I'm going to sneak in an interjection here. Uh, I, I, what I happen to do for a living is work in computer software, and let me tell you, I have made mistakes, and everyone I know has made mistakes. If you try to go into the front door and guess a billion passwords, yes, no one person can do that easily. Software professionals and security people make mistakes. They often rely on security through obscurity instead of genuine strength. No one will ever dial this number in Sunnyvale, California. Why would they even know it's there? I thought that was very realistic, and uh, this movie contained the most realistic depiction of spear phishing, researching a targeted adversary to learn more about the decisions they might have made that I have ever seen in a movie. I completely love that part, uh, and so although, yes, things are exaggerated and simplified, uh, before I can talk about characters, Tom, I have to agree with you and, and say that, um, yep, yeah, security always has holes. There will always be a hole somewhere. on the Druidian air shield of one, two, three, four, five, the kind of combination an idiot would have on their luggage. Um, the Air Force had an even worse combination on actual nuclear weapons. To prevent our intentional launch by a crazed, crazed or deranged person, there was supposed to be a combination number called a PAL, or a permissive action link that you had to get uh, from higher command authority to launch the missile. Except setting the PALs on thousands of missiles and warheads was a real pain. So what the Air Force actually set them all to was, brace for it, I'm going to tell you how to launch a Minuteman missile. Zero, 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 zero. Now you know the secret. So, so there is no security that cannot be undone by a human. Uh, skipping to what I'm actually supposed to be talking about in characters, we both had a great time with them. Uh, Aaron especially loved the way that, you know, it, it's hard to convincingly play young people. Matthew Broderick's big smiles, the just uninhibited emotions and gestures uh, that really, even though he was in his 20s, made, them, made him and Ali Sheedy feel like teenagers. What should we blow up? Las Vegas, boom! the characterization of the Whopper with the menacing shots of the lights and the, the shots of the timer counting down, it's hard to characterize a desk, uh, and they really did their best with that. It was great to uh, see the counterpoint between Professor Falcon's talk about extinction, it's just natural, and Broderick's indignant response that, yeah, but it's stupid, it's random. What does it even mean? Because they're both accurate points of view, and both characters sell them very well. Uh, they, 
the characterization near the end got a little bit annoying. The professor nodding at Matthew Broderick like he was a prize student there in the in the war room. Uh, but but still, you know, in a good movie, you have to have good characters, and the exuberance of the teenagers is something that really helped sell this for both of us. Uh, very supportive characters. Uh, I just have to stick up and say, yeah, any security can have stupid holes, and they usually do. NT5 TM. Excellent. Okay. Now I got comments on that too. Um, W five E B B. David over in Dallas. What did you think of the characterization or any additional comments that you've heard so far? Go ahead. This is K E five I six. Well, I'd focus on uh, the uh, General Berenger character is is probably my favorite. He's played by the actor Barry Corbin, who uh, lives in Fort Worth on a on a 15 acre ranch. So uh, you know he's a country boy, and and that's the kind of character he portrays with his uh, oh let's say colorful metaphors in some of his lines in the movie. The uh, some of the more interesting ones were well just unplug the thing. Uh, and, uh, gentlemen, I wouldn't trust this overgrown pile of microchips any further than I could throw it. And also the line about what he would do to a spark plug if he thought it would help. Uh, some, some choice, choice lines there. But ultimately, you know, this is a hardcore general, uh, and he's presented with, with all the data that he needs to launch a counterattack. But there's some intuition there that something isn't right. Something doesn't make sense. And that's what keeps him from, from launching. And, uh, you know, that's, that's kind of what, uh, what uh, is essential, I think. Was that human element to really sort through everything that you're being presented with and come to your own conclusion. And in this case, he made the right the right decision to, to wait for confirmation and uh, it was it was all it was all just a, a simulation w5 ebb hey, thanks david and uh, you make some really good comments uh what See, I think Jay said um, he's just going to listen in, so I'm going to go ahead and make my comments. Just remember, if you suddenly decide that we're out of court, we're out of order, you can say anything, even though you've checked in but checked out. But you can never leave. Uh, a couple of things about um, the characterizations. Well, let's see. Oh, one of them was I'm, I'm. The great thing, as I said, if you're net control, you get to take everybody's notes and then uh, turn them against them or for you, uh, which I think is the same thing. One of the things I thought was interesting is uh, the not so uh, veiled name of uh, Stephen Falcon, Stephen Falcon, who was on the island and the guy that created Whopper or Joshua or whomever, uh, Stephen. Stephen Falcon, does that sound familiar? Yeah, I think so. So I, I think that was not a cleverly disguised name for the characters. The other thing is, is that uh, Tony mentioned, and I thought this was great, is that the teenager, teenagers are teenagers. They act like teenagers, and they respond. They're smart, maybe too smart. That goes back to the Kevin Mindek thing I was telling you about earlier. I think that plays out, and it's realistic enough uh, that it could possibly happen. Back door? Yeah, definitely. Why not? We have back doors. I have back doors. I have back doors to my computer stuff at home while I'm on the road. I won't tell you how, but I can get in. Uh, other people could, too. If they know the right way and the right methods to do so, you can make that happen. You need that. And as is mentioned uh, quite honestly in the story, 
you need that in order to fix things when they go wrong. They didn't specifically say that, but we know that today. Uh-oh, I made a mistake. i got to get in and correct it before, I don't know, I go to jail because I messed up or I end up being sued because I messed up or I messed up because I messed up. The back door is the way of getting in and fixing something when you suddenly realize something went wrong. Watch CNN. You get it immediately, right? So, uh, that's another reason why I think the characterizations actually work. Uh, yes, there are the stereotypical generals and stereotypical stuff that goes on. I think that that plays in and is expected in a storyline. But one of the things that really works out well, in my eyes, in this film, is that it, at the very end of the film, you have to trust human intuition to figure out um, how this is all going to work out. And you think, oh, humans have got it all figured out. Because at the very beginning of the film, when they're launching the Titan missiles, um, the, the um, uh, uh, guy in charge comes back and he says, i got to make a phone call. This is crazy. And it becomes a question of whether can you do this or can't you? Can you or not can't you? Well, the information comes from a computer first and foremost, and then suddenly... There, and there's no interaction. I've got to talk to a human being in order to make sure that this thing doesn't happen or does happen. And that's the whole reason why they put Whopper in place. You reset. End of the film, or close to the end of the film, we do the same thing. We've got to talk to human beings to figure out what the heck is going on. And suddenly, you know, we talk to the three different uh, uh, bases that are targeted by the so-called missiles from the Soviet Union and uh, find out that they're still alive. Hooray! We're safe! But then the computer says, no, you're not. And then we have to figure out a way for the computer to figure out what the computer's going to do. And that's the random element. I think that's one of the things that really works in this film. You've got the yin and yang of it, but then there's the young, or we're hung. I don't know what. Uh, the thing that says this can't happen. Okay, uh, we're at the bottom of the list. I'll go ahead and ask if there's any additional check-ins at this point. Uh, we'll go ahead and uh, everybody else think about what's the next step. What do we talk about? The technical pieces of the film. So I'll go ahead and take the, uh, any additional check-ins. If you'd like to join us, please come now. Nothing on Echo Link, nothing uh, over air. Oh, let's go to the top of the list. N5HYP, Tom, what'd you think? technologically technical about this film. Did it work? Didn't it? What's it missing? This is N5HYP uh, for the, for the uh, Afterglow Movie Net. You know, back in 1983, it was pretty cool. Um, I mean, it was uh, computers were were uh, were becoming a big thing. I didn't have a PC. I had a Commodore 64. Um, and so, um, you know, some of the technology back in 83 looked cool, except for the physical design of Whopper, which was just kind of bizarre the way they made it look. It didn't look like any other computer out there. In fact, earlier on in the movie, um, you see um, uh, Matthew Broderick's character and Ellie Sheedy um, heading into this data, 1980s data center with all these um, uh, mainframe computer um, tape drives and such like that. And that looked like a real, a real computer center. And then 
had the Whopper, which looked like um, a tractor without wheels with flashing lights on the side. Uh, it drove me nuts back in 1983. It still does. But the um, the computer, the displays on the the flat screen displays on the wall or projection screen displays on the wall at the Norad Center were uh, pretty cool looking for that time frame. Pretty futuristic because there just really wasn't much like that out there. So um, uh, from a technology standpoint, that worked for me. This is N5HYP back to that. Thank you, Tom. Uh, WB5OZL, Miss Brenda, what do you think of the technology? Good, bad, indifferent? Yes, no, tell us. This is WB5OZL. Um, I thought it was good, from what I could tell. Um, the, yeah, I agree that the Whopper was um, a little bit hokey, but... Um, I, you know, I think it kind of led to events and drama of it, all those lights and everything. Uh, if it were just a, you know, a, a big cabinet with uh, tapes going back and forth, it might not have been as effective as it was with all the little flashing lights. It's kind of an R2-D2 thing. You um, didn't need to have lights and beeping, but this is part of his personality. Um, the, um, uh, yeah, um, it, I was a little surprised they were able just to walk into NORAD. Uh, I would think that they'd probably been shot on sight. That, that was a little bit unbelievable, but, you know, aside from that. All right, very good. Thank you, Brenda. Interesting comments. Let's see. Next up, N5, RPZ. Mark, oh, wait a minute. Whoops, I'm on the wrong list. Forgive me here. Uh, KF5, TSK, Burl. What do you think about the... Uh, the the technology and anything you want to add. Go ahead. Um, well, I would say that as far as the movie, you know, the Whopper computer that, you know, it, it has the ability to talk. Uh, and uh, what bothered me the most was, you know, the acoustic modems. You know, it, it was like... Uh, they were still available, but they were so expensive that, you know, uh, everyone either had an internal or an external modem, but uh, certainly not the, the acoustic type. Uh, and I was surprised at the displays that, uh, you know, they were so realistic and they, they actually, you know, moved. So, uh, uh, but, it, you know, Overall, everything looked realistic to me, and uh, uh, technology, I think they did a good job. KF5TSK back to net. Okay, very good, Burl. And I have additional comments on your comments. KC5OZT, Miss Carolyn, your comments about technology. Good, bad, indifferent. What's up? Go ahead. Well, to me it looked pretty impressive, you know, the, uh, the, all the 
flashing lights and everything. And you know how much I know about computers, but uh, and then uh, but the display showing the uh, missiles and the uh, all that that was sort of sobering, you know. To think if it had been real, you know. But uh, like I say, that was a. Uh, uh, sort of impressive, though. And then the home computer, uh, yeah, uh, um, having a dial phone, I mean, by the 80s, we'd moved on to the princess style phone, you know. Uh, my mind, but, uh, yeah, so I guess they had to, uh, uh in that time period or something, but, uh, and, uh, anyway, that was uh, my impression, you know, of case 5 oz Oh, I have comments galore, but I will hold off. NT5TM, Tony and Aaron, your comments on the technology. You're one of those guys and she's one of those gals that has been priced to figure out one of those guys. Tell us more. Well, Erin, uh, I did relay to her uh, David's comments about General Berenger, and she agrees. She thought that was a great character. Uh, for the, the technology, man, I didn't know what it cost, but my dad had a terminal with an acoustic coupler for work in 83 and 84, uh, so I thought that seemed totally period appropriate, and I thought the graphics did seem realistically crappy. We had an Atari home computer, little known fact, they made home computers with floppy drives as well as game consoles, uh, and, and frankly, the graphics were better than that, so I thought it very believable that government computers would, uh, would have those, uh, those monochrome graphics, even though apparently, according to Wikipedia, they were very hard to render. They took like a minute per frame uh, to produce those graphics. And I think the Aaron the Whopper was more of a character than a technology artifact, so it was supposed to look sort of unrealistic and strange. And, and by and large, the technology I thought was supportive and looked appropriate. Uh, with the one caveat that the stock footage of, of missile silos and things did look better in the day after, uh, because the day after reused a Air Force uh, promotional film that was shot in actual missile silos and on an actual emergency airborne command post, so they didn't have to use effects at all. <laughs> they just recycled on copyrighted film. Uh, so I thought the technology fit very well and seemed really period appropriate. NT5 TM. Very good. This is KE5 ICX. Uh, Net control tonight. Afterglow movie. W W5 EBB. David, what you think of the technology? Good, bad. Could have been better, worse. Tell us. Well, I, I think the uh, the technology special effects were 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 good. I mean, they uh, they were uh, certainly uh, bedazzling. In terms of the you know the lights on Whopper and and the, uh, the computer graphics, which were fairly advanced for the for the day. Now I, I will say that the lights on Whopper though um, may not have been too unrealistic. I uh, in what seems like another lifetime, uh, back in the 90s I worked on uh, um, multiprocessor systems and software, and you also had to to know the hardware because what we used were called uh, transputers. They were made in England, and they were basically a board with a single processor on it, and, and uh, we would have like 100 of those in one chassis. And you had four LED lights uh, per board, and those were, that was your method of debugging. So you would be able to see the lights blinking in a certain sequence that is correct, and if one of them deadlocks or uh, you know, has a problem, you'll see an LED pop, on it, pop up on it. But in normal operation, 
you see a cascade of, of Christmas lights. <laughs> and, and because debugging was so difficult, that's how you could visually see whether it was working correctly or not, kind of, kind of like Whopper, W5EBB. Very good. You brought up some memories there, David. Okay, this is KE5ICX, I'm Net Control for tonight, Skynet. I will be taking check-ins in just a moment. The movie we're talking about is War Games from 1983. We've discussed technology, the actors, and the plot and storyline. So uh, if uh, you're coming in late, you would like to discuss those things, you can in just a moment. So formulate your thoughts if you're out there, and I'll go ahead and make my comments about the technology uh, myself since I'm at the end of the list. Here's what I think. I thought it was fascinating. Watching this film was really interesting and reminded me of my days. I worked for a major company back in the 70s and 80s, uh, not known for electronics, but they spent a ton of money on it company was Xerox, and they came up with a lot of the technology that we use today, believe it or not. Now, one of the things that uh, came out of this uh, uh, was, uh, first off, uh, just the hard drives that you see, the removable hard drives. I worked on those darn things. Uh, they were throughout the movie when uh, they were trying to figure out what went wrong. They had all the doors open, and they're looking at all the hard drives that were out there, the removable hard drives is, is what they were, uh, and uh, uh, trying to understand what was going on there. Let's see. Let me reset. The time of the... Uh, 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 of. Um, the, uh, you know, the personal computer in that, the AMSI computer that was there, that was, uh, that was gold back in 1976. That's what everybody wanted, or 75, I think it was February 75, I think I saw that popular science. I'm going by memory, but I think that was about the time. The computer with a screen, all of that was super cool back then. Little did I know that in a few, few years, um, Three years later, I'd actually be working with that stuff. So that was uber cool to me to see it. Um, the computer was already dead in 1983. Uh, that thing hadn't been used in a number of years, and we'd moved on. The acoustic modem that was used in that was already passe. The 212A, I think it was, that they showed on the display. And indeed, that's what it was called, although I don't think it was that obvious on the, on the thing, acoustical modem. We had already gone to uh, uh, the, uh, the uh, dialing in types, 1200 baud modems, and I had one of those, and I had my first computer in 1981. Oh, let me tell you, no, I won't tell you about my Xerox 820 computer, but it was fantastic, and it was much better than the, the Amsite computer that they had. Cool, right? No, I know it's not. But for me, and we'll move on, is uh, first off, I was a computer nerd. I love that stuff uh, to death, and I still do to this day. But watching and seeing all of that back then, the probabilities, the possibilities, the capabilities that were there, uh, that they suggested were there, and I really believe that. And I think that it's probably even more uh, to deal with today than it ever was back then. I think the vulnerabilities, the things that they suggested as far as the technology was concerned existed then and it still exists today, maybe on a, on a higher plane, I don't know, but it still exists and I think that that makes this movie very pertinent. He seemed controversial, controversial or not, but I think we have to be ever vigilant going forward when it comes to this sort of thing. That's my my religious uh, uh, text, I guess, tonight, is, is that it, 
all of this can still happen, and probably does to a certain extent. So I think the movie really is pertinent in this day and time. And this is KE5ICX, I'm Net Control for tonight's Afterglow Movie Net. Anybody else would like to check in? We've hit all the major plot points, uh, the things that we normally talk about on the movie. Uh, I'll go ahead and, and take open check-ins. If you'd like to join us, please come now. I'll go ahead and ask for um, anyone on Echolink if you'd like to join us. Please do so now. There's some chat going on, but they are amongst themselves. So I'll go ahead and open up the discussion. If you have additional comments you would like to make about the movie, please come now with your call sign. Five, Tango Mike. We usually have a backup here. That's okay. NT5TM, go ahead. Much Tom Yip. I was expecting the open farm to get very busy. Uh, I wish Jimmy KE5TUZ were here because he worked for years. I don't know if he still does. He might for a company that did all sorts of security consulting. And one of the things they specialized in was physical penetration testing. Uh, if you take a well-dressed young person with a clipboard and just have them try to walk through the door, will, they, will someone let them in? Uh, because I have seen that kind of thing work in buildings with very sophisticated security. Yes, in theory, we are all supposed to be more secure now. Uh, but in practice, I, I, again, I loved the illustration of spear fishing, him carefully, re Matthew Broderick's character carefully researching his target. Uh, every time you erect a barrier, uh, there's a way around it on either side, and, and technology has not changed that problem. NT5 TM. Uh, you reminded me of a couple of things. I'll, I'll finish with these comments. Is, is that I keep mentioning Kevin Mindnick, uh, the, the, the kid that, that uh, was able to uh, hack into a lot of different systems. And um, he ended up, I remember watching on television here uh, live when he was uh, turned himself into the FBI. He was on the lamb on the road. And the thing about it is, and I think that the, the characterization by Matthew Broderick in this film was actually Kevin Mendick. Uh, and as such, uh, he was looked upon as, as a dangerous suspect through all of it. But in reality, what he was able to do was do social engineering, and that is really more important, I think, in this film than just the back door. What are the vulnerabilities? How are people, how do they act? How are they able to um, gain access to stuff? Isn't about the greatest technology to present it. It's the weakest link, which is people themselves. And we suffer from that all the time, which is, again, why I think this film is so pertinent, is, is that the human foibles are the part that really make this uh, film uh, still scary even today. Um, I, I One of the things, too, I was going to mention about Kevin Mimic is he was a ham radio operator. He 
got into amateur radio back in the 70s and 80s uh, simply because he thought that um, people who were involved with it were involved in the phone company. They were EEs, they, and they are today. They're still a part of all of that technology, and he thought it was uber cool to be able to do so. He had the ability and the, and, and the wherewithal as a teenager to figure out, memorize people on an org chart. Uh, when they uh, walk, when he would walk into an office somewhere and he'd see names, he'd see business cards, he'd pick them up, and then he would take and, and commit those to memory, and then he'd be able to get into uh, 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 telephone centers, you know, local local telephone uh, uh, locations, and then say, well, I know uh, David uh, wouldn't wear with all. Uh, he told me it was okay to be in here. Uh, and uh, I am doing a security check or something, or I have to fix this widget. And they let him in because nobody was going to do so late at night. And these were the things that were going on exactly at the time that War Games came out as a movie. And I think that it's interesting that it hit dead center of the things that were going on then, even though we didn't know it. So I'm going to stop now, but... I, I just find this film very uh, reminiscent of those times and very pertinent in the here and now. So this is KE5ICX. I'm doing uh, After Glow Movie Net. I'll ask if there are any final comments or final check-ins. Please come down. EBV, you've got the last word. Go ahead, David. Well, I think uh, you know the, there. When the, when there are technology layers, there there are layers with points of weakness. And when those are discovered and uh, and uh, are found out, often the fix is to add additional layers of technology to or to upgrade to the next technology and to not identify the weaknesses in the process that got you uh, to that vulnerability. Such that, you know, an errant mouse click or a, a radio transmission can activate public alert sirens in different cities for a long time. And, and uh, it's, you know, basically the problem is not being solved with the right uh, critical thinking, I guess. Uh, technology is not going to fix technology when there's people involved. And finally, the uh, various movies we've seen recently, as selected uh, for Afterglow, reminds me in, in summary of uh, the movie, what is the name of it? Burn After Reading, uh, a dark comedy. Um, uh, and, in, and at the very end, it said, what did we learn? And uh, then I don't know. I guess we learned not to do it again. But I'm not sure what we did. Yes, sir, it's hard to say. You know, so it's, <laughs> it seems like we're in that loop too often. W5EBB. Thank you, David. And I, I think sometimes the best stories are those uh, worth repeating. <laughs> it's like the best actors are worth repeating in the old uh, horror movies. Is is that if the story, if the thought process continues to take us back to square one and tells us that elementally something's going on, we need to pay attention to it. And I think that's one of the great things. I want to get too serious here, but I think films. Uh, whatever they are, have a tendency to bring us home back to what the heck is going on uh, and how the heck do we understand it because the human condition continues to be the human condition. And it, it, it brings home a lot of these ideas over and over and over again. I think this film has a tendency to do that. It levels us with 
uh, the vulnerabilities and the possibilities with computers, even though the film was, you know, what, 30 years ago? So, more than 30 years ago. I'll take that as a uh, cautionary tale. All right, uh, I asked for additional check-ins. I think we're done for this evening. I'm going to go ahead and, and do what we have for next week, and I will go ahead. I'm going to look for Burn After Reading and see what I can do with it. If um, a movie you are interested in that you would like to go ahead, well, I'll tell you what, I'll go ahead and ask. Uh, I know everybody's falling asleep, but if you've got a movie that you would like to put on the list, let me know now, and I will make sure that it's on the list. Please come down. Tango 5, Tango Mike. Your suggestion. Go ahead. A couple of thoughts Aaron and I have had lately. Uh, I can't remember. I saw we've done Doctor Strangelove, but I don't remember when. And Aaron wonders if we've ever actually done Aliens, uh, the uh, one that got the Oscar nomination, NT5TM. We've not. I think that's the John Cameron uh, sequel, which I think was actually better than the original film by, uh, uh, who was it? Uh, I should know. Uh, I don't remember. But, uh, yeah, I think that was the James Cameron uh, sequel. No, we've not done it. them on the list. Those are both excellent films. I'll figure out a way to get them into the rotation. Okay, excellent, excellent, excellent choices. I love them both. Um, which means they get on the list no matter what, right? Uh, no, I won't say that. Okay, our next film, if you're interested, next week, uh, the 21st of April, is a personal hated film of mine from Hal Roach Studios. Yes, Hal Roach Studios. You're going, what? Some of you know who that is or know what that is. Some of you do not. Hal Roach Studios actually produced um, Power Gang. You don't know what that is. Little Rascals. You don't know what that is. Raw and Hardy. You don't know what that is. Starship Invasions was done by Hal Roach Jr. Studios up in Canada in 1977. That's going to be our movie. It has inflatable spacecraft in it. You'll love it. 1977. Um, that's it for me. Any additional comments, please come down. Catch you all next week. Same time, same bat time, same bat station. This is KE5 ICX closing the net at, I don't know, what is it, 2356 local time, 73, everybody. Thanks for participating. We'll catch you next week here. Bye bye.